and welcome everyone um, to this event of the Cercle Franco-Britannique, which is jointly organized with the UK chapter of our alumni association. Today, we are very pleased to welcome Tom Baldwin, who is an author and journalist and used to work for the Labour Party as well, um, and who has recently published a very impressive biography of Sir Keir Starmer, who, as most of you know, uh, would become the uh, next UK Prime Minister. So thank you for, uh, very much for being with us, uh, Tom. Um, I will leave you the floor for about 30 minutes before we open up to questions from Linus, who is in London, and who is the president of the UK chapter, as well as from the audience. Um, so Tom, perhaps you could start by setting out how this project, how this book, which you call uh, an uh, authoritative but not authorized uh, biography came about and how you structured your work and then perhaps uh, move on to um, uh, who this uh, unusual politician uh, uh, is. Microphone, please. Hi, uh, thank you very much for that. Um, the book came about because about two years ago, I was asked to help Keir Starmer put together an autobiography. Some people call it ghosting. It wasn't quite like that. Um, and I started work on that. And it became pretty clear pretty early on that he wasn't very comfortable with an autobiography uh, being written by him or for him. He, he didn't like the idea of 300 pages of him talking about how great he was. It just wasn't the sort of thing he liked doing. And that's, in a way, a kind of a clue to who he is. In that most politicians I know like nothing more than to spend a lot of time talking about how great they are. Um, and there's a quality to him which is very unpolitical. He's not, at one point I was going to call this book The Unpolitician until I realised it wasn't actually a word. Um, so... Sorry about this, Tom. No worries. You were saying an unusual politician. Yeah, I was going to call the book The Unpolitician. Um, then I realised that actually isn't a word. It's probably not very good to have a hardback biography of a likely future prime minister with a title which isn't actually a word. Um, but it does somehow sum him up as much as anything else. Um, I, I sometimes use this analogy of if you can picture in your mind a man standing still on a patch of grass, he does not move immediately seems to be lost in thought, and eventually he takes a step forward, and then he stops again, and he looks around, two steps to the left, one backwards, one step to the right, another two steps forward, and so on. What's he doing? The answer is he's working out how to cross a minefield. And that's one way, I think, to think of Keir Starmer and his approach to politics. Because we expect, particularly in this country in recent years, our politicians to charge forwards, waving flags, making heroic speeches. And people have followed them. They've ridden behind into the valley of death. Uh, there's not to make reply, there's not to reason why, there's but to do or die. And Starmer's style may seem strange, inelegant, uninspiring, even confusing. But he's someone who proceeds on the basis of the best evidence available to him. Forwards, backwards, sideways, then forwards again. And it's the best way to cross hazardous territory and get to the other side. And that's as good a starting point as any for discussion of what is Starmerism, who is Keir Starmer. But at this stage, I just probably do some disclaimers. I'm not his spokesperson. I used to do that for another Labour leader, Ed Miliband. I've got the T-shirt, been there, done that. My book is not an authorised biography, as you say. I'm pretty sure he doesn't like every word of it. But I'm not pretending it's some sort of hatchet job either. I'm a former journalist on The Times who went off to work for the Labour Party. 
I like Keir Starmer, and even though I don't agree with him about everything, including Europe, I think he'd make a very good Prime Minister if he gets a chance. And I've had an awful lot of access to him, his family, his aides, his oldest friends, his shadow ministers. I've done more than two dozen interviews with him for this book. And the result is a sympathetic biography, not a hagiography. The reason I think why the book has been well reviewed, even by newspapers otherwise quite hostile to him and the Labour Party, is that it tells the story of a complicated person in the way that most people are, but our political leaders, particularly in Britain in recent years, are rarely allowed to be. The truth is that most politicians don't fit the clean, straight template of dividing lines and clever strategies. And Starmer is more complicated than most of them, because in his mind, at least, he's not really a politician at all. He doesn't have the tight backstory, the big vision or the easily digestible policy soundbites expected of a political leader. And he has instinctively, stubbornly resisted and defied definition. And that has made, him, made it harder for him in many ways. But it also helps explain some of the success he's had in politics and in changing the Labour Party to make it more electable. Indeed, one of the essential paradoxes today is that most polls say the British public loathe and despise politicians. And yet almost everyone I know in politics wrings their hands and say, why can't Keir Starmer be more like a politician? So if you listen to this passage from his Labour Party conference speech last year, last October, he said, it's exactly in moments like this when people want change, need change, cry out for change, the hope of the easy answer can prosper. And conference, we cannot be about that. Changing a country is not like ticking a box. It's not the click of a mouse. Long-term solutions are not oven ready. If you think our job in 1997 was to rebuild a crumbling, crumbling public realm, that in 1964, it was to modernize our economy left behind by the pace of technology. In 1945, it was to build a new Britain out of the trauma of collective sacrifice. And then they were waiting for like the three word definition of what he would do. He said, then in 24, there'd have to be all three of those challenges. And you can almost hear the sound of political strategists tearing their hair out. I was, I, was, I was surrounded by some of his aides listening to the speech and they were completely silent. Some of their heads dropped a little bit because they all want to be able to sum him up in a single sentence or better, a three word slogan. And we've had lots of those in this country. Yeah, Modernise or die, fixing the roof, take back control, strong and stable, get Brexit done. But real life, real problems and real solutions are more complicated, more nuanced and more interesting than that. And I think Starmer, perhaps you'd expect me to say this as his biographer, is more interesting than most politicians. And this emphasis on complexity, ambiguity and nuance does not or does not necessarily lead just to technocracy. My contention is that it takes you to a fiercely held, but not rigid set of values. And most people would say they have values, but they would struggle to codify them or place them on an ideological spectrum. They would probably also resist calling them an ism. And I think what Starmer represents is not Starmerism, certainly not populism, but a pragmatic expression of quite familiar British values, values that stretch across all the parties, mainstream parties. And for Conservatives, they probably represent a pre-Thatcher, certainly pre-Brexit, pre-Culture Wars era. And if I was a Conservative, which I'm not, I would be a lot more worried about Keir Starmer's lasting appeal than some Conservatives seem to be. Quite often I hear people say, oh, he's just a lucky general. He's been blessed by the mendacity, the recklessness or sheer incompetence of the last three prime ministers he's faced. 
I've heard it suggested that all they need to do is get a half competent leader back in, and Starmer's poll lead will evaporate as fast as it has appeared. I think that completely underestimates the problems faced by the Conservatives and underestimates him. Rishi Sunak 1.0 was meant to be competent and decent. He was started off by contesting that centre ground of competence, decency, integrity with Starmer. But it didn't last very long because he was swiftly pulled away into the badlands, the bandit country on the far right of the Conservative Party, which has done for his four predecessors, and I expect will probably do for him too. But this lucky general view of Starmer is unfair also because it doesn't explain how Starmer has been able to avoid the swamp of Labour's own marshy fringes, how he's changed his party with a ruthlessness and speed that defies the caricature that he's boring, why he didn't charge across that minefield. So he was elected leader on a centre-left unity ticket. And that was how he led his party for the first year. He took steps forwards, sideways and backwards. There was no grand plan for crossing the minefield. He was working it out. But when he got to safe ground, he then built a 20% poll lead quicker than anyone, except possibly himself, had expected. To take the Labour Party from where it was in 2019 under Jeremy Corbyn, trusted neither with the security of this country nor its finances, to one which is reassuring, stolid, sensible, grown up, is a considerable achievement. Not one of a lucky general, more like that of a very good lawyer. So that's what he is. He's focused not on the grand arcs of rhetoric or elaborately constructed narrative, but results, outcomes, winning his case. He never won a case in the courts of law based on what his parents did for a living or the kind of house he grew up in, or indeed his vision. He won it on the basis of evidence and facts. And the result is that he's brought change to the Labour Party and change to our politics through piecemeal actions, which like English common law, slowly build themselves up into jurisprudence. You know, we don't have the great Napoleonic principles or Roman principles of law. We have this common law, which, which every case is made in slightly different ways to a slightly different audience. He changed the shadow cabinet. He got control of the ruling executive of the party. He changed the rules on handling disciplinary cases. He changed the rules on selecting new MPs. He then sacked the person who came second to him in the leadership contest to succeed Jeremy Corbyn. And then he sacked Jeremy Corbyn himself. That's not happened in a main political party where the pre previous leader has been sacked, thrown out of the party, not since Ramsay MacDonald back in the 1920s. He then pushed through party reforms designed to turn the party inside out so it no longer faced itself, but faced the electorate. And even then, he's continued taking these steps, steps sideways, these steps backwards. You know, Corbyn had his party membership reinstated before he had the whip in the parliamentary party withdrawn. The original plan for party reform was to bring back an old system for electing leaders, which had to be abandoned quite quickly because he wouldn't have got it through. So that he raised the threshold for MPs nominations instead, which had the same effect. It meant that you wouldn't be able to get a leader from the fringes of the party elected. But the overall direction, once he established some principles as common law principles, has been relentless and ruthless. And I think his opponents don't always understand this about him. And again, it comes from not really being a politician. He's not tied to factions in the party or friends. He's not burdened by the ideology. And that means he can move faster without that baggage. He doesn't hang out in the bars of the House of Commons. He doesn't like that sort of politics. He doesn't usually even have politicians or advisors back to his home. He shuts the door, doesn't want to see them. He wants to see his old friends. He doesn't like labels. He claims not to know which members of his shadow cabinet 
were supporters of Tony Blair or supporters of Tony Brown or Gordon Brown. He actually claims not to know the difference between them. What he does is what has to be done. I'll tell you a story about my former boss, Ed Miliband, who was leader of the Labour Party between 2010 and 2015. He's probably known Starmer longer than anyone else, uh, anyone else in politics. And there was a time in, I think, in 2021, when Starmer couldn't do Prime Minister's question time in the House Commons because he got COVID. And he asked Ed Miliband to step in to, for him five minutes' notice. And Ed did really well. And all the parliamentary sketch writers went, there's the passion. Isn't it marvellous? That's what we've been missing with Starmer. They never were that nice about Ed when he was leader, of course, but that's how politics works. And Starmer, rather than having his nose put out a joint, was about his understudy had done rather well, bombarded Ed Miliband with messages saying how well he had done, how brilliant he'd been. He even sent a message to his wife saying, when Ed walks in through the front door this morning, tell him from me how brilliant he was. Make sure he knows it. Three weeks later, he sacks him as shadow business secretary, business secretary. And that gap, that dichotomy between decency and ruthlessness, I think is quite unusual. Most politicians don't behave like that. They don't, they build up their allies and they build up their friends because they're going to be there for them when they really need them. do not see it like that. It just compartmentalizes it. Now, some of that relentlessness and ruthlessness is sourced in his childhood. And I've probably chiseled more of that out of him uh, than we've known about before. He's often summed it up in the past with, with a line that has journalists rolling their eyes in boredom and frustration. My dad was a toolmaker, my mum was a nurse. But the reality of that childhood was a very tightly bound environment. An austere, quite scary father who couldn't tell his son that he was proud of him or that he loved him. And his dad's rigidity and resentment is a story about class back in the 1970s in England, about deindustrialization under Margaret Thatcher, a time when being a tool make maker meant something if you're in a town like Burnley or Blackburn. But he grew up in Surrey. And being a tool maker there just meant you worked in a factory and people looked down on him. And he didn't feel respected. And that burned away in his father. There was also a very sick mother who was in terrible and increasing pain from a horrible disease that caused her joints to swell and her immunity system to attack itself. Several times she was rushed to hospital with his, her children thinking she was going to die and they wouldn't see her again. He had a brother with special educational needs that meant he was dismissed and picked on and bullied. He had two sisters that never matched his achievements, who Keir Starmer left behind to go on to university. He was the only one of those children who went to university. There were multiple dogs. They had donkeys. There was no TV. His dad would play Shostakovich really loudly. as an old socialist play Shostakovich really loudly. Wouldn't allow on TV. There was, wasn't much room in that ramshackle but tightly bound house for someone like Keir Starmer to learn to emote or express his feelings. And I think it explains why he doesn't do so easily now. But it also explains why he's the first Labour leader in a generation to talk about class and to talk about snobbery, and why one of his central missions now is to break down the barriers of opportunity. He talks about shattering the class ceiling that holds people back in this country. I think above all, it's where he gets the capacity to steal himself to do whatever he has to do. For his mother getting out of bed, getting dressed, getting anything done meant pain. And for Starmer, getting out of that house, getting on, getting success, getting elected, all involved pain. He doesn't like the process of politics, but he will do what he has to do. So my book also describes other influences. Football, there's a whole section called footballism, which is real for him. Like other politicians pretend that they like football because it makes them seem more like men of the people. For Starmer, it's pretty obsessive. One of his friends says you probably have to tone it down if you want to look normal. But it's one of his ways of letting go, being part of a collective 
a crowd that stands up simultaneously and roars at a last minute goal is what a tightly bound Englishman does when he lets go. It's how he normalizes himself because he's always used it to, you know, he wasn't allowed TV at home. So when he went to school, they'd be talking about what they watched on TV the previous night. He said, let's play football instead because that would make it normal again. And he uses it a lot. You know, his language is filled with football metaphors, leaving it all on the pitch, you know, playing like a team. Because that's how he translates the world a lot of the time, I think. He's got friends, deep, lasting friends, uh, from different walks of life. Uh, you know, he has a one friend called Colin Peacock, who didn't go to university, never lived more than 15 minutes away from him. And he hates politics. And I asked him, what are you going to do when Keir Starmer goes to Downing Street? He says, I'll be there for him. I'll be waiting there for him to fail because I'll say, I told you so, I told you so, I told you so. And he really values that kind of friendship because with, in the absence of ideology, I think he needs those links back to a real life. That's where he derives his values. The pub is important. And I've seen lots of politicians go into pubs and usually they go behind the bar and they pull a pint rather badly for the cameras. Starmer merges into the background with the other middle-aged men better than any politician I've ever met, including Nigel Farage. Families, the one he left behind and the one he's made in London, they're important for him too. So important he doesn't talk about them. If you start making them part of your political brand, they lose their power. Not just he's trying to protect their privacy. It's like if you see the film of your favourite book, you can never quite imagine that book again. And I think he doesn't like to bring these parts of his real life outside politics into politics too much because it will contaminate them and it will lose the power to refresh who he is. He has this very strong sense of place. There's a communitarian side to him. His wallet has these words, take me home to Kentish Town and Boston and back of it. That's a bit of London he lives in. So I think these, this bit of real life anchors him because he doesn't have a sort of political background or ideology. He can't be structured. He locates himself not in politics, but in real life. The same reason he doesn't like the word vision. Ordinary people don't have visions. If someone came up to me in the street and said, I've just had a vision, I'd more likely direct them towards the nearest hospital than towards Downing Street. He doesn't think the ambition that Labour has for government can be summed up in three words or even three paragraphs. The policies he will pursue in power if he gets a chance won't always be headline grabbing, spectacular, or even easily understood. He's more like ordinary people in that way, and also in how he changes his mind. He bends and he swerves like our road system, like our common law system, forward, sideways, left, right, backwards, then forwards again. He doesn't really do straight lines. But generally, so far, he gets there in the end. Nor does he have some of the skills you would normally associate with a successful leader. That may become a problem for him. He hasn't built a big group of allies, Starmer rights for himself in Parliament. He doesn't do the performative side of politics perhaps needed to inspire people, given the tough times that Britain faces ahead. But he also doesn't get enough credit, I think, for improving and learning on the job. He'll never get as good as some people at making big speeches or debating, but he gets better. It's painful, but he does what he has to do. When he makes mistakes, and he's made many, I think it's quite instructive how he responds. Some politicians double down behind that mistake. Starmer is quite good at recognising if he has a deficiency or he's gone wrong and saying, well, how do I make sure I don't do that again? How do we make sure this doesn't happen again? And that's, I think, quite a good sign for how he'd be prime minister. It's always for him about doing what he has to do. I remember asking his wife once when he went up to get changed or something. He said, he's hating this. He's hating having to talk about himself with this book, isn't it? She went, oh, yeah hates all this, but we do what we have to do.
That's what we've always done. And there's a hardness to that, which I think I haven't always seen in sometimes more charismatic politicians. So much of our politics in recent years has been spectacle. You know, like we had Tony Blair who'd conjure up these visions of castles in the sky, which for all his many qualities, didn't always get beyond the artist impression. We had Boris Johnson, who would gather a huge crowd around him as he set fire to some of the things we value most in this country. Starmer talks about building blocks. And he talks about moving one building block and put it on another. His arguments always have building blocks to them. And watching people moving building blocks around isn't much fun. It's boring. Journalists won't write about it. And they turn their back. The difference between Blair and Johnson on the one hand, Blair on the other hand, is when you come back, Starmer's built a house and the other two have just made a lot of speeches. So I once asked Starmer, is there such a thing as Starmerism? And he said, I, I, I don't know. You know, it was in his house and it, it, we'd just come back in and it was freezing because the boiler was broken and he had to get the plumber out. And then the plumber arrived, he had to make the plumber a cup of tea. Then his children started arriving home. And at one point, you know, his cat, Jojo, got into a fight and he had to go out and separate the cats in the fight and he came back bleeding from one of his hands. And I said, well, come on, what about Starmerism? Is there such a thing? What about this, perhaps a new relationship with the state? Because, you know, he has talked about ending this 50-year convention that, you know, we just leave the free market, do what he wants. He wants a more active intervention in the state. And the way he explained it was through a conversation with Gordon Brown, who he said after financial crisis, he thought businesses had changed and they had recognised had a bigger role in society as a whole. Then he described his that his mate Colin, who was waiting for him in the pub that night, who works for a firm called Procter and & Gamble and never went to university, but knows a lot about business. He thinks the same about businesses in the community. Then he started talking about Arsenal, his football club, and how they have a community programme for underprivileged kids. I thought that's very Starmer-ish. You know, you talk about a former prime minister, his mate down the pub and his football club. But it's not an ism. And he said, there isn't an ism. I just want to get on and do what I want to do. I want to get on and get things done. And so, in the end, who is this guy? I think there's a combination of ordinariness and extraordinary normalcy, impatience, relentlessness, a sort of a very unpolitical toughness. Most politicians I know define themselves primarily as radical and then if necessarily pragmatic he's the other way around he defines himself as first of all pragmatic and if necessary radical he doesn't have a big radical idea but a series of practical steps that get you to a radical place without gaining much attention or people always understanding what you're doing and he's certainly not perfect i think quite a lot can go wrong i think he may be overwhelmed by the scale of the challenges facing britain by external events, be it with Russia or China or Donald Trump 2.0 or climate change or technology. But I don't think people should underestimate him because those who have done are often now ex-politicians or they're my former colleagues in journalism. And a lot of them were saying when he first got elected as Labour leader in 2020, he had no chance of beating Boris Johnson, who was so charismatic and so popular and so wonderful. Well, Boris Johnson is now an ex-politician. And they're now writing, these journalists, that Keir Starmer doesn't have a chance of bringing real change to Britain. Well, I think perhaps everyone in my former profession of journalism should show a little bit more humility because no one thinks he's going to lose the next election now. And they weren't saying that three or four years ago. So he's ordinary, he's extraordinary. He's limited as a politician. Maybe that helps him. Maybe it will hinder him. But I don't think people have read my book. I've been left with the same impression of him that they had when they started. So that's something, anyway. Over to you. 
Thank you very much, uh, Tom, for for this uh, introduction to this remarkable book. Uh, I believe Linus has a, a first uh, question to kick off uh, the discussion with the audience. Linus, over to you. Thank you, Olivier, and thank you very much, Tom, for, for these introductory remarks. Uh, um, very insightful, and uh, of course, we all try and trying to get our head around um, Kisama, um, uh in, in the run-up for the election. Um, I was wondering whether you could um, say a little bit more on, on the, the connection that you were making between this uh, rational ruthlessness in operating um, and, it, and his past uh, that I think you were making, um, looking back at his parents and his relationship with his father. How did that, uh, do you think, shape that ruthlessness? I think it's, it means I think he doesn't really suffer people whinging about how painful things are very much. But he's not unique in having had a bit of trauma in his childhood. Lots of politicians have that. Indeed, there's some evidence to say that successful politicians always have trauma in their childhood. Um, I think it gives him a sense that, you know, it doesn't matter how painful it is, I'm just going to do it. And it gives him a, a, a peculiar sort of drive um, in which he's not going to, you know, he kind of puts all the nasty things that he doesn't like about politics into one bucket. So talking about his mum and dad is as painful for him as breaking a pledge. It's just like some of the things you just have to do to get elected. I don't really want to talk about it. And whereas other politicians will see those as almost entirely separate tasks. He just regards it as all rather unsavoury business. I've got to get to it. I'm just going to get on with it. And then I'll wash my hands. And then hopefully we can get into government and do some stuff. Now, yeah, there's always a question of when the means consumes the ends. And he does regard politics as a means to an end. And I think he feels uncomfortable in politics. But that's where this connection back to real people, I think, matters. You know, he's not ideological and he's not particularly political, but I think he does have quite strongly held values. And one of those values comes directly from his dad, which is people should be respected for what they do. He doesn't like snobbery. He doesn't like that kind of Oxbridge swagger. He doesn't have it. And I think potentially, given a fair wind, I, there's no guarantee he will get a fair wind and he's got a terrible inheritance, but potentially there's the prospect of a prime minister who will look a bit more like England than other prime ministers have. You know, back in the 1930s, there was a conservative prime minister called Stanley Baldwin, no relation to me, um, who from the centre-right seemed for a while to represent a kind of Englishness, country before party. And I think he could maybe replicate some of that on the centre-left of the Labour Party. But perhaps, you know, most of the, you know, as I said at the beginning of the book, you know, he thinks he hasn't achieved anything yet. So the real biography of Keir Starmer will have to be written if and when he gets to government and after he's left office. Uh, but, you know, I think there's a potential there for him to do some politics slightly differently. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, I believe Cecile has a question, which is actually the same uh, as the one I had. So, Cecile, over to you about the program, I think. Uh, thank you very much. Um, yeah, my question was, what what are his priorities for, for the country? Is he talking about economy, education? Yeah, there's, so he, he spent much of last year setting out these five missions, and they're still probably the most underreported thing in Westminster, because people just thought they were too vague and they it wasn't part of the sort of Westminster parlour game that they usually play. But those five missions, why I think they've survived and why they're the best guide to what he would do, is they're all quite personal to him. So the first one, the biggest one, is growth. And he set a sort of unfeasible target of the fastest growth in G7, which I think outside the European Union is pretty hard to achieve, if not impossible. But the idea is it's meant to be a stretching target. So by prioritising growth over everything else, you will get more growth than you would otherwise. He also wants growth in every region. He doesn't want to just heat the city of London and then redistribute the proceeds. Uh, the second one is clean energy by 2030. Again, very, very stretching target. 
but I think they will get credit for getting closer to it than they would have otherwise and providing a kind of stable focus for what they want to achieve. Uh, fixing the NHS, getting it fit to future, turning it into a preventative service rather than just a curative service. That's big for him too. And you know, then a lot of that goes back to his mother. Uh, safer streets. Uh, you know, he has a, you know, in his legal career, he had these very horrible cases of rape and murder, which I think changed his view of human rights. And he now thinks quite hard about the rights of victims as well as people just accused of crime. And then I think probably the one which is most personal to him is the one I mentioned earlier, which is overcoming and breaking down the barriers to opportunity wherever they are. And that's about you know his brother and his sisters who he left behind. That's about the unfulfilled potential of so many people in this country, which, you know, it's strange. I mean, I think our country is dominated by class, but our politics doesn't talk about it very much. And I think it's a very, very real issue in this country. And it's quite refreshing to hear someone talk about class, not in a Marxist sense. Some of it is actually about ambition and aspiration. But he is aware of this snobbery which holds people back. And I think that's quite, that's, that's, that's quite unusual. Okay, um, thank you, Tom. I believe there was also a question from Marie Elizabeth uh, about Brexit. This is a little bit uh, more down the line, but uh, go on, Marie Elizabeth. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom, for your um, very interesting presentation. Um, can I go back a few years? I mean, when Starmer uh, said that uh, he would be in favor of a second referendum on Brexit, in which he said he would vote remain. Um, ultimately, if I remember well, the, the, the policy was uh, included in the 2019 uh, Labour election platform. Now, you said at the beginning of your presentation that uh, you didn't agree with him. I mean, I, I'm quoting you uh, about Europe. What exactly is his position on Europe. I know Europe has become a taboo word, a taboo subject. Nobody wants to touch that with a barge pole. But what is Starmer's position on that? So that second referendum, I, I, I helped run the campaign for what we called a people's vote at the time. And we had three of the four biggest marches London had ever seen. And that's when I first really got to know Keir Starmer because I used to have a lot of meetings with him where I was trying to persuade a quite reluctant Keir Starmer to back our campaign, which he eventually did. You rightly point out. After 2019, when Boris Johnson won an 80 seat majority, I think he recognised that Brexit was going to go through. That campaign was before Brexit had been finalised, remember? Mm -hmm. And there was nothing much more we could do. And I think, like most hardcore Remainers, I'd probably accept that, you know, we're not going to go back into the European Union anytime soon. And, you know, sometimes I think Remainers have lost their understanding of Europe as much as the Brexiteers have never really understood Europe. I don't think Europe is desperate for, you know, Britain to say, well, we're ready to rejoin now. and We're all going to like just be that sort of difficult country again. They don't want to go back to that drama. What there is, is there's incremental steps back towards a closer, more workable, practical relationship with Europe. And I think you'll take them. Now, he said no customs union, no single market for a lifetime of the next parliament. I think you can take quite a number of steps in that direction without actually crossing the line. The deal he was trying to negotiate with Barnier back in 2017, 2018, was for a customs union. I don't think he'd call it that now, but I think you can have a much closer working relationship, which will work better for Europe and work better for Britain. Now... You know, this is not a closed game. There are external factors. Europe itself is changing. There are external factors like Russia and Ukraine. There's external factors like Donald Trump. If Donald Trump wins in November, Europe may be left fighting a war against Russia on its own without America. Now, one of the things that Labour talked about is a European security pact. It may be that by this time next year, the European Security Pact will be a whole lot more important to the debate about Britain's relationship with Europe than the single market, because Britain will be a leading player in a European Security Pact right away. And so, you know, it's events, events, events. 
Europe is a dynamic issue. Our relationship with Europe is always going to be dynamic and quite hard to predict the future. Who would have thought back in 2015 we'd be leaving? You know, who would have thought, you know, Donald Trump after he left the White House in disgrace would have a chance of winning again? You know, the future is very, very unpredictable. What can be better predicted is the reaction of a leader like Starmer, I think, in that he is very steady, he's very evidence-based, he's very pragmatic, first and only, if necessary, radical. So I don't think you should expect any big, bold initiative on Europe. I think you'll see him usually choosing to align rather than to de-align. But, you know, incrementalism, it, you know, <laughs> steps have to lead in a direction. And sometimes they lead to a very big choice at some point. I don't know when that will be, but I suspect it won't be in the next parliament. It might be in the one after. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom and Marie-Elisabeth. I believe uh, Ramin, who is a famous professor at UCL and who was also a guest in London, also has a question. Ramin, over to you. Well, pleasure to be here. Uh, so on my question is related to the uh, you know economy. So what do you think would be the biggest policy change? How would he redefine uh, the economic policy under his, his leadership? I think in some ways the biggest change is counterintuitively stability. Mm -hmm. In that there has been very little stability in our economic program for the last 14 years. We had austerity followed by panic after brexit followed by boris johnson's spending spree followed by liz truss's madness followed by some rather sharply party political decisions taken by rishi sunak and jeremy hunt to sort of salt the earth with 19 billion pounds worth of spending cuts scheduled for the next parliament the first two years of the next parliament which will i think really really compromise what labor can do and simply saying look there is going to be a stable platform on which to invest is quite a big change and i think you know the evidence suggests that there's quite a lot of pent-up investment ready for stability on which businesses can plan and investors can plan the other big change i think it you will wait and see how important it is is this idea of a new relationship between the state and the market both gordon brown and tony blair basically bought the dominance of free markets. Um, I don't think Reeves and Starmer do so. They believe in uh, not necessarily a bigger state, but an active state. They're looking for what they keep using this language of partnership, which is not quite corporatism. But it's a, there's going to be a lot of industrial policy. There's going to be a lot of skills policy. And they're looking for businesses and private sector to come in and help them achieve their missions. They're not just waiting to be lobbied and saying, oh, could you get out the way and we can get this concession here? The question is, can you help us achieve your missions? In which case the doors open. If you're not really helping, help, interested in helping us achieve our missions, we're a whole lot less interested in what you've got to say. And so potentially you're going to see a sort of quite a big change, you know, almost, you know, biggest change in the relationship between state to market we've had since, you know, since Margaret Thatcher came in. There's now in the process of working out exactly what it means oh, like, oh. you, know, the, you know you have these mission boards which are meant to involve people from the private sector and the voluntary sector public services which are going to be in government they're going to be decision making bodies the problem is you can't take everybody with you which businesses are you going to take which 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 you know voluntary bodies are you going to take which representatives from the public services are you going to take and i think kind of that sort of selection process is something that they're trying to work through now because it, it's something that may be more difficult to practice than just saying it as a slogan. Thank you, Tom. I had a question about the electorate of uh, Keir Starmer. Uh, does he appeal to young people, urban voters, uh, mostly in the south, or is it rather more balanced? And uh, does this include voters in the north? Uh, I believe in your book, at some point, you mentioned he had difficulties with the the, the mayor of Manchester, Burnham. Uh, and I guess this bodes um, quite uh, unwell for his relationship to the Red Wall voters, does it? Um, well, the polling suggests that Labour are going to reclaim the so-called Red Wall. 
um, I think it's always a little bit invidious to think of voters as sort of bricks in a wall, as if they're just inert, waiting to be smashed or rebuilt. You know, in the same way, there's not such a thing as a solid working class voter or a Muslim voter or whatever. You know, there are individuals who make decisions on all kinds of mixtures of values and priorities. Um, certainly, I think Labour has gone some way to reconnect with the working class voters it lost, although the, you know, the real party, the British working class now is no party. Since 2001, a majority of working class voters don't vote. Uh, we can sometimes exaggerate, you know, like our news coverage after 2019 suggested that, you know, millions of former coal miners voted for Boris Johnson because they hated immigrants and loved Brexit. Boris Johnson only got 300,000 more votes than Theresa May did when she was humiliated in 2017. What was different in 2019 was the opposition was much more divided. Um, they're certainly looking now beyond the red wall. They're looking to seats which, you know, Ed Miliband was targeting in 2015, and they may actually win some so-called blue wall seats, some very traditionally conservative seats. The Liberal Democrats may pick up a number there as well. Um, Starmer's appeal, I mean, the truth is Starmer has less appeal than Labour Party at the moment. There are lots of people, you know, among the young and the left who feel he isn't saying enough, that he's not sort of bold enough, that, you know, some of them yearn for Jeremy Corbyn. I think sometimes that voice is exaggerated because they're very prominent and loud on social media. And, you know, for every one of those votes he's lost, I think he may have picked up 10 in the centre from people who didn't trust Jeremy Corbyn at all. But, you know, he is the least unpopular leader at the moment, but all leaders are pretty unpopular. And I think it's certainly fair to say he has not broken through with a sense of excitement and, you know, hopey tingly stuff in a way that Tony Blair did in 1997. It may come. And I think, you know, he's someone who thinks by delivering real outcomes and showing that government and politics can work, can actually build support rather than starting off at a high point when you're elected and then slowly disappointing people. I think he thinks it's almost the reverse, that by showing that you can deliver real change, not try and solve everything, but fix some things, that will actually restore some faith in democracy. Again, the proof will be in the pudding, as we say here. And I don't know, I can't predict the future, but I think that's how he wants to lead the Labour Party. Thank you, Tom. Um, I believe uh, Anais had a question as well, uh, if you are able to join us, Anais. Yes, thanks a lot. Um, well, it's directly relating to what you've just said, but um, I was thinking, considering his character, um, maybe his lack of, um, well, so-called charis charis vibe, I know this is much more difficult than that, yeah. and um, the fact that all his policy is based on evidence, is based on pragmatism. I was just wondering if somehow he was not more suited to be a prime minister than to be the leader of the opposition, because I suppose, well, it, it's extremely difficult with this kind of character to have the very um, binary vision somehow that um, um, polit well, politicians and your party may expect, you know, just to be the leader, uh, the leader of the opposition and to um, destroy somehow uh, the policy of the uh, of the other side. So I was just wondering if you would say that maybe is most the most difficult for him is to be electing that properly uh, ruling the country, um, and maybe in elect uh, with this. I was just wondering um, um, how does he manage if he does um, to unite all the factions of his party behind him, considering precisely his character and the very. Um, um, tough context in the UK? Um, good question. I mean, look, I don't think he's looking to unite all the factions of his party because he's made a pretty clear choice that there are some people in the Labour Party who probably shouldn't be. And if you're going to exist as an entity, you have to have borders. Under Jeremy Corbyn, they used to say there are no enemies on the left. And he would, you know, if he had a Labour Party meeting, cancer, he'd go off and address some Socialist Workers' Party rally. There are borders and there's 
a reason why a Labour Party isn't a Conservative Party and the reason why a Labour Party isn't a Socialist Workers Party. It's a centre-left party, not a left party. It's not a right-wing party. Um, there are lots of people who think that Keir Starmer probably is better suited to being Prime Minister than leader of the opposition. Uh, you know, Mario Cuomo, uh, Cuomo, who was the former New York uh, uh, American politician, once said, you campaign in poetry and govern in prose. I think with Keir Starmer, like he campaigns in prose and will probably govern in bullet points. Um, you know, he, he wants to, you know, he's in this not to make big speeches, but to bring change. That said, the inheritance he's got is so rough. The economy is in terrible shape. The international situation is really worrying. He's got to make £19 billion of public spending cuts for public services, which are already on their knees. And he does have limited political skills. And I think he needs almost some of those opposition type skills if he's going to be able to pull that off in government. So, you know, he has huge challenges. I just, but as I say at the end, I'm, I'm just wary of underestimating him because every time people underestimate him, he sails on and they fall behind. Thank you. Uh, Claudine, you have a question too. Can you turn on your microphone? Yep. Okay, that's on. You hear right. me? Yep. Uh, hello. So, um, Tom, thank you very much because uh, you are giving us some hope and refreshing, uh, uh, I would say, view in, a, as you say, in a perspective where everything is especially negative and um, and pessimistic and, uh, and especially regarding the next election elections in the world so just cross fingers um on the party I, I had a question about the party but I think you you answered it uh, more or less uh, regarding the unity of the party and how much he will get the support of his party because uh, if we compare in other some of other countries sometimes could be an, an issue and if you look at the Tories right now, uh, that's re a real issue. So how much he will, you know, really build on that part, which is important, but you partly respond uh, response to it. And the second aspect is you say that you interviewed his um, mo most or part of his uh, shadows ministers. And how would you characterize uh, his team and I would say towards the portraits that you gave us, and how again are they really uh, in the same? I wouldn't say mood, but uh, same kind of pragmatic, some kind of, or there are some different uh, character. That's my um, question. Thank you. Okay, so on the first part of the question, a sort of underrated fact in British politics is that if Starmer gets a majority of one in the next election more than half the Labour MPs were been elected under his leadership. And that is significant in that, you know, he maybe doesn't need to make so many friends now because there are a lot of people will be looking to him as the person who got him elected. Um, you know, he, he doesn't like the transactional side of politics and doing all that stuff. But again, he's got better at it. You know, he started having meetings with backbenchers, started spending more time with junior ministers, junior shadow ministers, because he knows he has to do that. It's a deficiency in him, and he's forcing himself to do it, even though he likes meetings with a piece of paper and a decision. Um, uh, so I forget the second part of your question now, sorry. Uh, that was on the shadow. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so his team's actually, his team's interesting. Yeah, through, through, through the interviews you had, so. Yeah, so his, but his team is very interesting in that it's the most working class shadow cabinet for a very long time. There's been this long period of a sort of what's called a sort of spadocracy. People, who, former political advisors who met at each other at Oxford University, who've gone straight into politics and then become MPs and then want to be ministers. And he's got some real characters. I mean, where Streeting family were organised criminals in East End of London. Angela Rayner left school at 16, pregnant, with no qualifications. Pat McFadden, his parents were immigrants from. Ireland, who spoke Irish, not English, when he was growing up. I mean, this is like, 
Yeah, there's, there's, it's it, it's quite an unusual group of people. Now, some of them, it said, are not up to it. There are a lot of people coming in, and some people are former ministers of the last Labour government, people like Douglas Alexander, who a lot of people would expect to get a job. Uh, but I can't, most people don't know who these people are. You only get to know, really, the identity of politicians when they're in power, and then characters are formed. So when people say, oh, they're a bunch of non-entities, well, of course they're going to be non-entities because they're an opposition. And I think there's, you know, there's potential there for quite an interesting group of politicians who are more like him than most governments have been in recent years. You know, Rachel Reeves, she came from a very lower middle class background. She went to Oxford, but she like she always liked to beat these sort of smart ass posh boys at chess because she was very good at chess and numbers. And there's a lot of it's about overcoming and feeling you know, you have to work twice as hard because people would judge you. And there's a, quite a lot of that going on in the Labour Shadow Cabinet. I think they're quite a good, interesting team. Thank you. And do they also uh, get on well with one another? There, there were talks of, uh, you know, uh, incomprehensions uh, between uh, Starmer and Rayner, for example. No, I think I think Starmer and Rayner, pretty, they get on pretty well. I mean, I don't think the... Sort of tensions that existed between Tony Blair and Gordon Brown did so much to disable that last Labour government to exist between them. Um, there are tensions at the moment around Starmer, which I think is sometimes inevitable. Um, every leader's office has those tensions. I was part of a leader's office, and you know, even Tony Blair's, you know, I used to write stories about you know, how they were fighting like rats in a sack, and Alistair Campbell would made, made two of the people I've mentioned walk along Brighton seafront for the cameras while they were swearing at each other under their breath to prove that they really loved each other. Um, there are always tensions, and that's sometimes creative. I think there's a particular tension now because you're moving from campaign to thinking about government, and that involves a different group of people. So the people who are absolutely central to the campaign and winning the next election aren't so sure about what their role will be in government, if any certainly their skills will be less relevant. And so that's a sign of Labour getting ready for power. It's a symptom of Labour getting ready to power as much as a symptom of them all hating each other. Mm. I see. Um, thank you. Uh, is there another question? Or should I shoot my uh, uh, a last one before we, uh, we close the event? Um, is there another question? No? Please raise your hand. Okay, but there doesn't seem to be a, a, another one. I, I had a question about uh, his legal career beforehand. Can you come back on the controversies uh, that he faced when he was director of public prosecution, please? Well, every three weeks or so, a Sunday journalist is briefed that the Conservative Party has a great dossier of material gleaned from going through the files of his time as Director of Public Prosecutions, which will astonish and shock the electorate. I haven't seen much evidence of that so far. Um, you can always make a particular case sound quite gruesome. And you know, this is a long-term problem for lawyers who have a principle of defending people because they believe in a fair trial or taking decisions about prosecutions, which may not immediately make logical sense. But you know, this is... I think it's, you know, we'll see. I mean, one of the reasons why Boris Johnson made an allegation that Keir Starmer covered up for Jimmy Savile, probably the most notorious paedophile and rapist this country's seen because he was so famous. It's rubbish. And Boris Johnson's own head of policy resigned in protest because she thought it was rubbish. Rishi Sunak, when he was ch Chancellor of the Exchequer, said it was rubbish. But it's sort of politics, the sort of Trumpian politics that Johnson used to do. And polls showed that half of Conservative voters believed it. Because with social media, you can throw a lot of mud around it and it sticks into the crevices of social media more effectively than it ever did into the crevices of the old media. And I think the Tories will try it again. And they've doubled the spending limits for the next election for a reason because they want to spend big on social media advertising. That's the new weapon of choice. 
for politics. It allows you to target ads to people's fears, tailor-made to individuals. Other people don't always see them. You don't even know what's being said about you. And we're going to see a lot of that in this election, as we will in the American elections. We'll see in all the elections taking place this year. Um, I don't think there's a smoking gun in his record at the CPS. I may be wrong, but I did quite a lot of work on it. Indeed, Dominic Grieve, who was the Attorney General, a member of David Cameron's cabinet, is on record in my book saying Keir Starmer did such a good job they wanted to give him another term. It's quite invidious then for the Conservative Party to turn around and say <laughs> he was the most you know, controversial, disgraceful head of the CPS ever when they not only you know, applauded him out, but they wanted to give him another term. Uh, we'll see. We'll see. I mean, look, they, they, they will throw lots of stuff at him. It'll be a very dirty campaign, as all elections are now. <laughs> I think a more interesting study, which journalists should do more of, is to look at his record of actually running the CPS, which was, you know, 8,000 civil servants. And he did reform in a pragmatic way. He didn't come in with some big, bold, radical plan. But when the institution was challenged, rather than defend the institution, he challenged the institution back and said, maybe we should change. And I think that's very typical of how he operates. He doesn't, doesn't start off by making a big, bold promise, but becomes more radical in the face of evidence. And, you know, there, there's... You know, if people want to know what he's going to be like a prime minister, it would be more instructive to look at his record at running things than to try and dig out some case which might embarrass him in the next general election. I see. Well, we'll have to uh, to see uh, if Starmer regrets uh, not having run for a second term as uh, as DPP at the CPS. He'd have been too old to be a politician if he had. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, uh, I think we will have to leave it there. Uh, you, you've already spoken to us for, for more than an hour. Thank you very much, Tom, for taking the time and presenting uh, this book, which I'm showing again uh, on the, the camera. It's a great book. It's a bit long, too, uh, so I haven't finished it, as you can see. Uh, I'm about two thirds into it, uh, but it's a, it's, a great, uh, it's a great read in the evening. Thank you very much, Tom, uh, and hopefully see you soon. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thank you.